Are we ready? So good evening, everyone. My name is Birch. And so tonight we're going to be learning a little bit about altars. We're also going to be learning about traveling altars, which is the theme of the class, and making a Yule altar. Um, and then we're going to do the, the arts and crafts. We have different stations set up. And everyone at home is welcome to follow the instructions, whether now or um, off YouTube, and make your very own traveling Yule altar. This, of course, kicks off the Grove's 2023 Yule festivities. So while we are building these altars, I will be sharing a couple of Yuletide stories with you all and maybe even breaking into song. <laughs> Carl, can you please um, put up the uh, slideshow? Uh, okay, and then next slide. All right. Yeah, all right. So first, let's begin by taking a look at altars, both home and public altars, and their relationship with how we practice our religion, whatever religion that may be, because these are found in almost every religious practice. So I have to start with a few definitions of altars from different pagan religions. In Wicca, an altar is defined as a raised structure of place for worship and prayer. In heathenry, it is often described as a sacred space set aside to make offerings to the gods. And in paganism, generally, you might talk about any sacred spiritual focal point used for connecting with your magical self and the divine. In Abilina's Grove, as you can see in front of us here, we set up an altar on the table every Friday when we gather. We call it Abilina, we light our candles, we say our healing spell, and together we turn this beautiful table into a pagan altar for the Grove. Um, we also build here at all of our seasonal celebrations and the year and a day ceremonies. Out in the yard, we have a main altar. We often have a secondary altar for personal deities if it's a year and a day celebration. We might have an altar just for cakes and ale. <laughs> so with these different altars, they always serve a different purpose, but they all kind of go back to that same central point of this is a way of connecting, of enhancing our magical workings and um, keeping the raccoons away from the food. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're all familiar in general with what an altar is, even if we rarely think about what an altar is specifically. Um, pictured there, um, that's actually part of my main altar at home. Um, it's the heathen section. So this is a place where I do a lot of work <laughs> with the Norse and Wolf and Ulthenar magics. Um, Different parts of the altar have different focal points. It's a large raised area. Um, so in summary, you might call an altar a space that has been set aside for spiritual purpose and activity, such as to develop a relationship with deities, celebrate a holiday, connect with ancestors, or practice one's magic. Next slide. So... Altars, a brief history. Personal altars within the home quite possibly go back to the very first homes, solid homes that humanity has ever built. In Katahuyuk, which was inhabited 9,000 years ago in what is today central Turkey, homes were found with spaces set aside with bullhorns pictured up top there. The purpose of these spaces is very much a matter of debate. But one theory is that this was the home altar where sacrifices and offerings could be made. Personally, I agree with this assessment. Some of the other arguments that it was a sleeping space or maybe some kind of <laughs> sitting area, like a throne, it to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The horns are pointed inward towards the wall, not outward. If it was being used for other purposes, such as eating, sleeping, or sitting, you would more expect the horns to be facing the other way so you don't accidentally impale yourself while you're sleeping. 
I mean, <laughs> but if you are having it as a sacred space, the inward pointing horns would make sense from a magical perspective. Mm -hmm. It turns the focus from the outside world to the inside world symbolized by that corner. And so those horns become a sort of barrier defining the difference between the mundane and the sacred within the home in Kadahuyuk. So that's why I tend to agree with the archeologists on this one who say that this is probably the earliest known example of a human altar in their personal home. And again, this was from 9,000 years ago in the Neolithic, in the Stone Age. Humans were doing this. So it's very probable that humans were doing it long before there were any structured settlements in caves, in, you know, the temporary dwelling places like homes of stone or, or homes of, you know, animal hide and sticks that would not have survived to the present day. It probably is a reflection of those even earlier human practices. And continuing through our history, we also see many examples of both personal and public altars all over Egypt, again, dating back many thousands of years. Homes in, ex in excavated sites such as Dair al Medina in Egypt show niches in the walls where votive statues of deities such as Bast, the cat goddess, and Tawaret, a hippo headed goddess of women and childbirth, were often found. Egypt also had many altars in public spaces, such as the one um, that you can see here um, at the temple, mortuary temple of Hatshepsut and the um, temple, and the, um, the, it's a sun altar. Home altars and shrines <laughs> can really be found all over the world. In pretty much every single culture, there is some variation of this practice. For example, um, the Roman Lararium, which we have a picture of here, um, is, a, is from the Roman Empire. It was a place where you would leave offerings to the lares, the ancestral spirits of your home and family. Um, in Japan, there are many Shinto altars dedicated to spirits called kami. The shrines to the kami were always placed above eye level, symbolizing the relationship between the human and the spiritual by placing them slightly above the human plane of existence. Um, in Scandinavia and Russia, Offerings to the Domo boy were usually placed at home altars near the fireplace. So kind of going back to the idea of the hearth magic that Amethyst touched on in an earlier presentation, uh, very often you would find a home altar near the fireplace where you could leave offerings to your house spirits in exchange for their protection of the home. So in a lot of these cases, especially the private altars, you're talking about something personal to you, personal to your family. But public altars offer the same links between the mortals and the gods, but on a much more, much larger scale. Many of these were located in grand temples where individuals could leave a votive offering, usually as part of a petition or a prayer, as thanks for granting of said prayer or both. And there is one such altar in the Mead Hall here, the altar to Minerva, and I have one little story I'm going to segue into explain how this <laughs> might work. So back in 2021, right when the COVID vaccines were first becoming available to people of my age, I spent a week trying in vain to get an appointment to get the shot. Nothing was working. Every space where I went in there was booked. And we had a presentation to Minerva. And the next morning I said, okay, Minerva Medica, if you can get me an appointment with Publix, I was on the Publix website waiting for them to open up again. And I said, I will crochet you an owl. And the moment those words were out of my mouth, all of a sudden, bam, I was in, I had an appointment. It was a perfect time. It was the perfect appointment after a week of no appointment. So naturally I found myself going, okay, I now need to give Minerva an owl. If this were 2,000 years ago, I could just go through any old temper of Minerva and here's your owl. 
but this is the modern COVID age, so at some point I need to get into the meat hall. <laughs> and the funny part is I left the owl on the altar to Minerva, and it was like months before Opal Luna suddenly was like, where did this come from? There's an owl here. <laughs> like where did this come from? Like, oh, that's the owl I gave Minerva. I guess she uh, put it back on the altar. Now she was kind of <laughs> enjoying it, keeping it to herself. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of an example of how a public altar would often work, historically and modern speaking. That you would offer some prayer or petition to the god. They grant your petition. You then go to the altar and you leave them an offering. So it's, you know, it's an exchange. It's a place of exchange between the human and the divine. So all of the altars shown here on this slide, stretching across a span of almost 8,000 years of human history, share certain characteristics of permanent altars, which go back to the original definition. Very often they're a raised space. The center area of the altar draws the focus inward, and there's an element of human, animal, and divine connectedness, whether it's the snake of the Laurarium, which Carl might need to move the, the things so you can see the snake. Um, but then there's also the bull's horns and Catahoyuk. And so all of these together kind of show like, show, um, you know, show those elements. And they're places where worshipers can come together, share in a common ritual, whether as a family, whether as a broader community. And I think this is because the home altar really shows a human instinct for religion in its simplest, most ordinary form. When people make a shift between living in temporary structures or no structures, to living in permanent homes, there was suddenly a separation there that hadn't existed before. When suddenly you define like this is now inside and there is outside, when we created that division between us and the natural world, we felt the need to bring the natural world back to us on some fundamental level within our homes, to still have that connection to those who have gone before and to the spirits of the natural world. And so by putting the altar inside of our home, we're able to still feel and make that expression, even though we might not be able to actually be outside in the caves, under the trees, we still have that same feeling we would have if we were standing there. So next slide. So, and then there was the experience of the peoples whose cultures did not settle down in large cities and dense population era, area, areas. People who were nomadic, people who, you know, lived a pastoral life migrating from field to field with the seasons. And so their shrines and their altars and their gods needed to travel with them. The traveling altar as we know it today, and that we're going to be talking about in this class, descends from this equally strong need to have a working space in which to connect with the divine, but one that is portable, sacred, and free to go. Wherever you go, your altar will follow you, or you will follow the altar, whichever way it happens to go. Obviously, without clear archaeological detail that we find from the permanent structures, it can be difficult to know for certain the specifics of what traveling altars have looked like across 9,000 years of human history. But we can know a few things. It's very likely that traveling altars are the older practice. As I was saying before, if you have the idea of the traveling altar that traveled with a nomadic group, when that group settles down, they would then bring the altars inside and it would go from being a moving structure to a permanent structure placed in a temple or a home. Um, but now in those societies which did not choose that development path, they continue to use the traveling altar in some cases to this very day. 
And for those of us who do not live a nomadic lifestyle in this day and age, even if we might want to, <laughs> we have to then re-reverse this historical trend and move from the idea of having a permanent altar and the altar being a set structure within the home to being something that can go with you wherever you are going. And to take a standard altar and make it into a traveling altar is to splice it down to the very essence of its alterness and shrink it further to allow you to travel with you wherever you might be going without too much effort. If you have an ox cart, as shown here in this beautiful 1905 depiction of the procession of Nerthus, a German mother goddess who is described by Tacitus, and this is based upon the descriptions that he wrote of the Germanic people of what is today um, northern Germany. They would have the her altar in an ox cart be pulled by the oxen, and in this way, your altar can actually be of a pretty good size because oxen are very strong with the wheels and the carts. You can get through rough terrain. But how many people here are planning on using your ox cart to move their traveling altars around? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's planning on an ox cart. in the shop. I have to find the ox first. No. Okay. So in this case, we're going to have to get even smaller. <laughs> Next slide. So, the compactness of a traveling altar needs that you means you need to get a little bit creative when you're thinking about what you want to put onto the altar. There was a question earlier asking, well, am I allowed to use this? Am I allowed to use that? The answer is yes. You can use anything that will fit. <laughs> <laughs> if it fits, it sits. <laughs> exactly, Kimmy. If it fits, it sits. <laughs> So you start with your box, and ideally, the box will be something you can hold comfortably that you can carry with you wherever you need to go, and if you need to bring it somewhere where no one else can see it because your family might not approve, something that is easily hidden within a piece of luggage or whatever you might need. So the smaller the box, the easier it will be to take with you, but you have a trade-off in what you can fit. So you need to kind of weigh, okay, how easy do I need this thing to be to carry versus how much do I want to put into it and what do I want to use? I have used a 12-gallon black and yellow storage box as a sort of traveling altar, but again, you're talking something that is very awkward and bulky and hard to move. Uh, but you can fit quite a lot of one of those things, and you don't need to sacrifice the size. Just be prepared to do some manual labor while you're hauling it to and from your destination. <laughs> but earlier I mentioned stripping an altar down to its very essence. The first step is you want to decide what kind of altar do you want to build? What is going to be the purpose of this beautiful altar that I'm holding in my hands? For today, let's say that this purpose is to create a traveling altar for a Yule ritual on the go. Okay, next slide. So, I am going to give you guys a hypothetical scenario here that probably many pagans, especially younger pagans, can relate to. You're on your way to visit your family at the end of December. You are pagan. The rest of your family is most definitely not pagan. Your paganness is very often a bone of contention around in the family to the point where all words related to religion have been banned from the dinner table. <laughs> okay? But you are going to be there at Yule, and you desperately want to have a Yule ritual while you are in your, you know, your grandma's house. Okay, but you can't have anyone know that you are carrying a Yule ritual in said house because grandma will have a fit. So you need something that's going to be discreet. And it's going to need to be something that can go in your luggage 
and come out of the luggage without anyone being any the wiser, including your cousins, who see everything. <laughs> so you need to decide, how are you going to perform this ritual without your usual tools? Because this little box is not going to be able to hold your athame. It's not going to be able to hold any kind of sensor, seven-day candle, any statues. You've got some beautiful statues of the Holly King and Oak King, but they're not going to fit. <laughs> um, you, you have some altar claws, but they would take up the entire box, even if you folded them very small. So this is where you have to get a little bit creative. Break everything down to the very essence of what you are trying to accomplish with it. The box, large enough for your needs, small enough to carry. These little three by five boxes, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. No one needs to know what's going on if you're carrying that in the house. No one's going to look twice at it because it, it's very discreet. You could get some kind of little miniature figurines that just, you know, so happen to be in a box. They're so cute. You know, a little Santa Claus for Odin, a miniature Yule goat, a Krampus, because, hey, <laughs> everyone's uh, German somewhere down the line, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just have to really like crows. Hmm, you know, little figurines like that. Put them in the box. If you um, don't think you can go that far, how about an acorn, a sprig of holly, um, you know, maybe a little tiny piece of mistletoe. How are they supposed to know you're not just bringing Christmas decorations along? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the smaller the smaller the object, the better it is for you. Insects. Little five dram bottles hold a few drops of the incense of your choice. And again, they're small and they can give your ritual a little extra something. And if you use a cinnamon oil and you happen to bring some cinnamon cookies in your luggage, <laughs> they're not going to know where the smell is coming from. <laughs> Or you, bring, or you bring cinnamon, anything. Yeah. Cinnamon cookies, cinnamon cakes. Or you bring cinnamon itself. <laughs> How are they going to know why you have sticks of cinnamon? Or a cinnamon broom. Yeah, exactly. You're getting the idea, Kimmy. <laughs> and then you <laughs> might need to cleanse your circle. So you bring a little tiny broom and you cleanse your circle with a little beer. Um, <laughs> for fire, a yule fire. Guess what? Who's gonna do? think twice about you having a birthday candle on hand? <laughs> it's you know somebody's birthday. Just make sure they, they they're not the trick candles. Exactly, not, not trick candle. So, you know, there you go. There's your fire. Now you've got a Yule fire, and you know you can have a wand. Hmm. My goodness, I just happened to have a sprig of pine with me. It must have fallen off my Christmas tree. <laughs> All right, so you just kind of got a little creative. If you want, you could add a little piece of copper or a little stone to your stick. And now it looks even more like a wand, but it just looks like you wrap copper around a stick to the unknowing eye. So all of these things can fit very easily into a tiny little box. And they can be carried with you wherever you go. And voila, within one little box, you have everything you need to do your very sneaky Yule ritual at grandma's house without anyone knowing what you're doing. So if that helps a pagan this year, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide. So with a traveling altar, you can have your rituals on the go, regardless of where you are or how private you need to be about them. And I did a quick little demonstration with a traveling altar I happen to have about how this might work. You light a candle, you take a pinch of herbs, or you light one little cone of incense and you sanctify your little tiny space. And then you can do a little working, you know, maybe you just do some prayers. This traveling altar has a rune dice set, so I did a little rune toss. Um, you know, and then you you got your broom, so you might sweep a little bit, 
you know, clear the space of all those energies. And then, you know, have a little bite of the cinnamon cookie that you brought along. <laughs> Hide the smell and have a little sip of meat because you'll need it. <laughs> and just like that, you've done an entire Yule ritual using only things that fit inside a little box. Might take 15 minutes. Nobody needs to know what you're doing in those 15 minutes. But you've at least had the chance to, you know, connect with your own deities while celebrating with family who might not understand what the hell you're doing. So, um, just take a really long bath and break. Right, exactly. Run the shower. <laughs> just get your hair wet afterwards. So I don't exactly. to text anything. You know, it's just all those little things sometimes, you know, you have to do and get used to. And as a side note, I was throwing the runes as an example. I just said, no, it's not real reading. I'm just doing an example. I just tossed it. And it still came up with I was, <laughs> which is, of course, a rune of sacrifice, death, transference, Odin, the world tree. You know, all those things that have to do with the death of one year and the beginning of another. And then, of course, there's Rydal. Okay, the road, the end of the road. You're traveling with this altar and Jera, the season. <laughs> A sideways Jera. Yeah, so it's like the end of the season, the end of the year, and thank you, cattle, money, and transfer. So again, this idea that, you know what? At the end of the year, at the end of, you know, middle of winter, you're traveling, you're going places, and, you know, things are on the move. I thought that was funny. Even these rooms were like, haha, we're going to give you a real reading anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we're going to do for the remainder of our class. You can go to the next slide. I think we're pretty much done with the slides now. Yep. yep. Okay. Sure. So you can go back to full screen here, and I'm going to go over um, what we're going to do. So we have different stations set up. We have people come up one at a time and just kind of stagger it, you know, like get to like maybe halfway through and then the next person come up and start theirs. You can choose the box. There's different colors. Okay, so you can get your box. If you want to have any kind of altar cloth, there's some random fabrics in here. You can cut, cut it to size. Um, and then as so you come along, next station we have little tiny pieces of pine fresh from uh, the tree farm. <laughs> I went raiding. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw away anyway. Wait, they're just going to go in the garbage. I rescued them. And we have little candles. And I also brought a few pieces of little modeling clay. I put out white, red, and green for Yule, but there's other colors if you need them. You can take a little pinch of this, and what you can do with the candle, you kind of roll it into a little ball and, and smush it flat, and then you put the candle into it, yeah. and now you have a candle with a base hey. that can stand up and fit inside your altar. And you won't burn yourself. And you will not burn yourself or anyone else. Oh, oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> So you can make a little base and a candle. Um, over here, we have cinnamon oil and a syringe. Um, they're little five dram bottles. So really just a couple of drops should be all you need. Um, they have a nice, pleasant smell. These little bottles are empty? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're empty little bottles, little five dram bottles. You can just take a bottle and just drop some oil into it. Then we have what Lulu was freaking out over, which is the Corvid, Crampi, and Yule Goat. Mm -hmm. So you can take, uh, you know, a couple of these and put them in your altar, whatever you want there. Then coming over to this side, we have uh, cedar or pine incense cones. And we have teeny tiny little besoms. <laughs> <laughs> so 
while we're doing this, I'm going to be reading to everyone from a story. You can just come up one at a time. Alba, if you want to start. Okay. And we'll just go around the table. This is very nice. You know, we'll do some crafts. Carl and I have seen a lot of traveling altars because we go to festivals. And mm -hmm. a lot of times people, I mean, these are pagan people going to a pagan place, but they still want to bring their little altar with them. You, yeah. you notice that too? Like outside people's tents, they'll have like little tables, a little tray table or something with, yeah, and they'll bring their, with mine. I put you, it in a box and then put it out or at least yeah. I had it inside the tent. Yeah. And then sometimes but, you'll see them just like they'll walk around the festival area and they'll pick up rocks and sticks and they'll just make a little display. And that's their, this place mm -hmm. altar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, nice. It's really a strong instinct we have. Okay. So, well, Elba's starting there. I'm going to read to you all a story of heathen winter called Grandmother Winter. She, it's a book for muggles, so she's not called Frau Perkta. But those of us who are heathens who know her are like, oh, there you are, Frau Perkta. I see you. So the story is called Grandmother Winter. It's by Phyllis Root with pictures by Beth Cromes. And so... Grandmother Winter lives all alone with her snow-white flock of geese. And this is how we know it's her, because Frau Perk has a lot of geese. <laughs> all spring, Grandmother herds her geese as they gobble and squawk, honk and hiss, flapping a storm of feathers. All through the summer, Grandmother gathers the feathers, soft as snowflakes, bright as a winter moon. Come autumn, grandmother sews on her quilt, stitch by stitch, stuffing it full of feathers. When the days burn down towards the longest night, grandmother shakes her feather quilt. Flake by flake, the snow begins to fall. When grandmother shakes her quilt, children come running from their homes, catching snowflakes cold on their tongues. Kind of interesting you did this in Florida. <laughs> Might freak out. <laughs> Grown-ups build their wood piles high and scurry for sweaters and mittens and skis. When grandmother shakes her feather quilt, cardinals and chickadees fluff themselves up against the cold. Snowshoe hares and weasels put on their coats of white. <laughs> When grandmother shakes her feather quilt, earthworms tunnel deep in the dirt. Brown bats hang head down, bundled in blankets of wings. Under leaves and in hollow logs, morning cloak butterflies sweep. Below the milky ice of the pond, pickerel frogs and painted turtles bury themselves in mud. Minnows and sunfish slowly swim. When grandmother shakes her feather quilt, bull snakes coil in old woodchuck dens. In prairie mounds and clumps of weeds, Jumping mice wrap their tails round and close their eyes. <laughs> when grandmother shakes her quilt, black bears yawn and burrow into hillside daddies. <laughs> Children pull off boots and coats tumble into bed to be tucked in. All night they will dream of flying over hills and making angel wings in the snow. 
Grandmother gives her feather quilt one last shake, blows out the candle, and climbs into bed. The wind in the pines sings shush, shush, shush. What does Grandmother Winter do then? Shush. Under her quilt, <laughs> thick as a snowfall, warm as a flock of geese, Grandmother Winter sleeps while the days drift down like feathers. And grandmother's geese, what will they do? Heads tucked under wings, they will wait until spring to gobble and squawk, honk and hiss, flapping a new storm of feathers. And you know what else comes in the spring? When grandmother winter wakes from her nap, she is no longer Grandmother Winter. She is young Ostara, the maiden of the spring, whose story we know with the bunnies and the birds who wakes every spring to bring in the summer. So. I think we were. Yeah, need a little thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> with your mama <laughs> tell <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So the Yule goats, of course, are from Thor. Uh, his two goats. I, I have a big one. Yeah, I don't you know. Have a big one? I don't know where I acquired it. It's like. Well, and so far the kid hasn't uh, hasn't come okay yet, but they like to play with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can sing songs, or I can tell you guys a story about the time Thor and his goats went out on an adventure. What do you want? Story. Thor. Thor. Thor? Thor. Okay. Thor. <laughs> All right. So I will tell you guys a story. So back at, um in on the road to Jotunheim. Thor and Loki were riding in his chariot, pulled by his goats. And one night they stopped at a farm to have a meal and a rest. And the farm had had a very harsh winter. There was very little food for them to eat. But the oh. family said, we would love to welcome you, but we have no food to offer you. We barely have any food for ourselves. So Thor said, well, if you promise not to eat any of the bones, I can provide us with the feast. And with Mjolnir, he struck down both of his goats, threw them in, skinned them, threw them into the pot. And the goats went bubble, bubble, bubble. But while the goats were cooking, Loki turned to the Alfie the young boy of the house. And he said, Thialfi, guess what? Thor likes to save all the bones for himself. <laughs> that is why he said not to eat them. But if you crack open and eat the marrow of the goat, you will become as strong as Thor. Mm -hmm. And like any young boy would, Thialfi waited until no one was looking and he cracked open the bone and he ate the marrow of, I think it was uh, reverse. Well, it, it, it was um, one of the goats. One of the goats. Forget which goat. <laughs> and so the next morning, Thor took the bones of the goats and he put them on the goat skins and he waved his hammer over the goats and said, Goats, rise. And his goats came back from the dead. But one goat limped very badly because its leg was broken the fourth day. And Thor was pissed. Yeah. Because these were his friends. Yes, he killed them, but he knew that he could bring back life again, so it didn't really matter. But he was so mad. The Elfie was like, it's my fault, it's my fault. But Thor knew where there's trouble, 
it's always Loki's fault. <laughs> so then he took the Alfie and said, it's, you must now serve me as my cupbearer. I'm not going to hurt you. You're just going to come and have our adventure with us. So now the three of them went on their way, but Thor did not take his chariot now because he was concerned about his goat and his goat needed to rest and heal. So they kept, left the ghost with the family and went on foot. And they were walking all day and it was cold and it was snowy because again, you're on the road to Yodemite. And they came upon a, what well, looked like a funny looking house in the middle of the forest. It had one big entrance, like a cave mouth, and one huge room, and one smaller room at an angle to one side. And they, but it was shelter, so they went inside and they went to sleep. But there was this weird whistling noise coming from just outside. And in the morning, Thor went out to investigate and figure out what was making all that racket. And as Thor was walking around, he found the biggest giant that Thor had ever seen. And Thor has seen a lot of giants in his day. Bought them and killed them too. And Thor was ready. He tightened his belt that gives him twice his strength. He put his hand on Mjolnir and was ready to do battle. But the giant woke up and said, oh, good morning, little guy. Oh, such a pleasant sleep. Well, you go? And he kind of sleepily fumbled about and he grabbed the house that they had been sleeping in. It's like, there's something in my kitchen. And he shook the mitten and out fell the elf. The elf fell Loki. And they found the snow, so they were fine. Plenty of snow. And the giant said, oh, there's three of you little fellows. <laughs> How would you like to accompany me? I'm on my way to Utgard. And lo and behold, so were the three of them. So they set off for Utgard together. And the giant walked so fast with his huge legs. He was the size of Abelina. He was so big. With each stride, he could cover a whole mile. So he, he got to you know, the next stopping place by like mid-afternoon and settled down. It was like had a meal and everything. He was rested. By the time Thor and Loki came panting up and the Alpi gasping along behind them, <laughs> the giant was like, oh, I'm ready for sleep, but I put your packs in with my packs over there. You can just open them and don't bother me. He just went to sleep. Well, the Alpi tried to open the pack. He couldn't get it open. Thor was like, no problem. Thor could not get this pack open with all of his mighty strength. He even put the belt on. Still didn't work. So they were all forced to sit there, fall asleep hungry, no dinner, while the giant is snoring his head off. And the next morning, the giant woke up and was like, oh, we're almost to Utgard. I just go on my merry way. And after that, uh, Thor and Loki and Thialfi went to Utgard, where they had many other adventures, which will be told about some other time. <laughs> but yes, both ghosts did end up being fine by the end of the story. By the time they got back to the end of the adventures, the ghosts were okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's a magical goat. He just needed a few days of, you know, R&R. &R. Yeah. When uh when I have uh, mule goats on my table at craft shows, uh, I I just I know who I can say this to. I'm, I'm like, they're sustainable and malicious, and they usually laugh. So the people buy it. <laughs> it it would probably work on you. To be honest, yeah. <laughs> so everyone have their yule altars. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Let's show them to the and people at home. A little show and tell to the people at home. My little altar. Oh. I got a little. Show oh, theirs. I got a little. Uh, oh, so crow good. and a goat. Yeah, I got with these one. My little I candle. Mm -hmm. I picked I cedar. Little, that looks good. Oh, it's about and my little bed. Bed. Yeah. Get big, I'll take this. Like the raven and the skull. Yeah. I can put this one to it. I thought that was good. 
And yeah. it was all like green and red and black. That's my colors. <laughs> I know, that's really colors. cool. <laughs> green vengeance. And the rest of the story is full whenever mm -hmm. I have an excuse to dress up as Ellie and become the crone. And we get her some mead. And you get me some mead, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Then we don't hear the whole story. And then the from um the, the, the winter from uh -huh. uh, it's a beautiful story. Oops. I like that like, idea. More mead, more stories. You plus if it's enough mead during Krampus stock, I can probably tell you a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that snow mother. That sounds a lot like the Kyliac. Is she? Yeah, I'm sure she and the Kaliak know each other from somewhere. Way back when the Kaliak still lived in Central Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and these little boxes, they're, they're from Amazon, and they're just like the perfect, the perfect size. They're very cute. Okay. And so colorful. And then, and then they get funnier if they were like little luggage bags. I was expecting that, like little handles. Little handles. <laughs> Then it would be literally a little altar. It would be. And you want you need an ox. You can just pull it yourself. Exactly. With your little Well, I guess you could convert it. Give it some wheels. Yeah. And and and, and like glue a little like wagon fr on the front. Like a sticker on it. Yeah. So and then yeah, the put some person. like little bumper stickers on it. Or make the little tiny mini trailer and put it on top of a trailer. <laughs> get, 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 get one from like a Barbie doll. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Barbie doll. Like, you know, it's just, but if you know, like, <laughs> well, you're a guy, so you would know this, but like when you're young, when I was younger, we used to, I used to have like all the Barbie dolls, like the luggage and everything like that. So you just take this and you have the wheels on it and just pull it like this. Then you boom, your Barbies and stuff. And, and then when it's closed up, see my raven. Uh huh. <laughs> Very it's like the raven to throttle all this to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought the raven is what just add a little something to the altars. <laughs> all those raven lovers. Yeah. There's enough raven and crow lovers in the group. I, I found the cramp eye and the yule goat, and then I found in the same search the raven. <laughs> and I was like, How did you get those swan like that? Uh, they're they're ornaments actually. Yeah, they have a little hole. So yeah, you can no, I hang see. Them. Yeah, I see, but are you gonna put like all of them in, in the tree? I don't know. Um, and slot might be going in the tree, but yeah, you can have a whole tree. Well, I'm just gonna get careful. Careful well, not the tree. Tree, it Yeah, it, it would be a tree. We could have we have a couple for the grove tree. Yes, please. I mean, yeah, we'll, be a crow oh, that's time. another thing. Next week we'll. Next Friday night, the Yule tree will be up in the Mead Hall. So um, we will have, be using all the ornaments from years past. So if anybody wants to bring a new ornament for the Yule Let's tree, we'll start them. doing that next week. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Any uh, last minute questions about Yule altars or altars in general? No. All right. Well, thank you. This was that fun was tonight. Fun. Thank, thank you. you. It was very informative. Uh, absolutely. I, I can't fun. wait to uh, see the Yule tree. <laughs>